So the next week you have the DNB CET exam. I wish good luck to all of you. And uh, <clears throat> you are all well prepared with image based questions and online tests and uh, uh, a very good revision of the uh, last 15 years of DNB question bank. I'm quite sure that you should crack the DNB exam comfortably, swiftly and confidently. So let's make the great beginning. A 34 year old female presents to the emergency after falling in the bathroom and she has got a wrist pain and numbness and uh, possibly dislocation of which of the carpal bones as pointed out here. Welcome Dr. Prasanna and many more who are all online. Yes, so uh, it is the uh, lunate bone which is quite frequently dislocated in case of um, the um, wrist joint, carpal bones is what you need to remember. A 23 year old presents to emergency with right knee pain after sustaining uh, a kick injury to an extended leg. So there is an anterior displacement of the tibia with respect to the femur. Then uh, what is the most likely injury MRI being given to you? Typically it is the lateral collateral ligament what you are seeing which is being torn. So lateral collateral ligament is also called the fibular collateral ligament. Whenever it is injured there will be a pain in the lateral aspect of the knee, there will be instability of the knee while walking and there will be a swelling and ecchymosis because of the trauma and uh, the lateral collateral ligament is injured whenever the impact is there on the medial aspect and medial aspect is the place where you are having the peroneal nerve and quite often peroneal nerve injury is an accompanying problem with the fibular collateral ligament injury is what you have to basically remember. A 24 year old painter presents to the emergency with a right shoulder pain after a fall and physical examination shows inability to extend the right wrist and x-ray is being shown to you. So right wrist inability to extend means radial nerve is injured, radial nerve is injured and humerus is um, fractured. So what is a vessel which is commonly injured whenever the shaft of the humerus is fractured doctor it is the brachial artery which is the one which is typically injured a 32 year old male complains of a lower abdominal discomfort and you can see the varicocele um, now left testis versus right testis so the left testicular veins where do they drain, right testicular veins where do they drain is the question. The right gonadal veins directly drain into the inferior vena cava. Whereas the left gonadal veins take a sharp bend where the left renal vein is located and um, um, then they drain into the inferior vena cava. So that is what uh, we have to basically remember. So left gonadal veins drain into the left renal vein, right gonadal veins drain, drain directly into the inferior vena cava is what you should remember. A 58 year old with uh, a bulge on the inguinal ligament which is increasing in size on straining and his hernia is being depicted in the figure. So there are two types of hernias you know very well. The direct is the one which is passing to the hazel backs. Indirect inguinal hernia is the one which typically passes through the inguinal canal and indirect is because of the patency of the processus vaginalis is what you need to basically remember. Now after the injury patient developed a weak right forearm flexion and an absent biceps reflex then what is the possible nerve which got injured and uh, what is the sensory area supplied by that particular nerve is what examiner want to know. So you should remember that the biceps shares its nerve supply 
with two other muscles in the anterior compartment and all these are supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve. Musculocutaneous nerve typically supplies um, the uh, lateral forearm is uh, what you need to ultimately remember. A interventional procedure had been done and the catheter had been cannulated into the femoral vein and it reaches the right atrium and from the right atrium it passes through foramen or veil and goes into the left atrium. So which is the first valve that it will touch? It will touch from the right atrium, from the inferior vena cava straight it is going up. It is not uh, looking at uh, tricuspid valve at all. And then it is passing through foramen or veil and then it will be passing through the mitral valve. So mitral valve is the one which is first touched whenever you are doing the cannulization is what you need to basically remember. 25 year old male fractures his tibia in a road traffic accident and typically he required crutches. Then he has a difficulty in performing this action. What is this action? Extension of the arm. So most likely nerve which is injured is the radial nerve in order to enable the extension of the arm is what you need to remember. A 43 year old is having a problem of urinary frequency after a car accident and his bladder is found to be small in size and it is contracted with only minimal stretching. That means it is very atonic. So what is the most likely possibility? So you must be very sure about the bladder innervation. If you look at our autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic comes through cranial nerves and the sacral outflow. Hence, it is called craniosacral outflow. And the sympathetic system comes out as a thoracolumbar outflow. That's what you need to basically remember. So, typically, it is the uh, thoracic cord which is injured and that has led to the interruption of the flow of the fibers to the bladder. Now 56 year old had a foot drop and loss of cutaneous innervation in the area which is being shown in the figure. So a simple question of the examiner is which nerve is the one which is injured? It is typically a common peroneal nerve injury which has got a typical cutaneous distribution as shown in the figure and also responsible for the motor uh, weakness of foot drop and loss of uh, uh, cutaneous sensation. That's what you are able to see here. Now, a patient presents with a problem in his vision and you have done the neurological examination of his ocular movement. And there is also a lack of corneal reflex on the right side. Then what is the most likely uh, problem uh, that uh, the lesion is located. Where is it located? So first of all, patient is able to uh, is unable to adapt his right eye. That is what uh, the neurological examination is showing. That uh, whenever he is uh, uh, trying to adapt his right eye, he is unable to adapt the right eye. Also, there is a loss of corneal reflex. So, if you look at the Superior orbital fissure, trochlear nerve, then abducens nerve, and uh, superior inferior divisions of the ocular motor nerve, they all pass through that. And uh, that can explain as to all the clinical features seen in this given patient. Now, a 28 year old film actress had epigastric pain, fullness after meals, and bilious vomiting. These are all the these are all the symptoms that started after uh, she has to lose about 15 kgs weight in a short period of 30 days. Nowadays, you see Dangal or Bahubali or any places. The film actors in one movie will put up uh, 100 kgs weight. Another movie they become 50 kgs weight. They are playing with their body. So, on laparotomy, her superior mesenteric artery is obs observed to have a sharp angle from the iota. Then such a vessel, what is the part of the gut 
on which it can have a impact and lead to the obstruction leading to these clinical symptoms. It is the transverse portion of the duodenum with which the supermesentric artery has got a close relationship and uh, in this kind of scenarios there can be a possibility of a compression that is happening um, uh, of the transverse portion of the duodenum because the supermesentric artery and typical history involves sudden loss of the weight. A 42 year old after a road traffic accident typically has got a foot to cheese dorsiflexed and uh, everted and he has a difficulty to stand on his tiptoes. History is something that you need to remember every nerve injury based on the history you must guess which nerve is involved and for these nerves you must know what is the root value. So that is how the localization based MCQs are asked in uh, NEET PG, DNB CET, USMLE in all these exams. So where is the sensory loss most likely to be? So let us quickly run through. If you look at obturator nerve, what leads to the injury of obturator nerve doctor? Anterior dislocation of the hip damages the obturator. There will be a paralysis of the adductor muscles, impaired ability to adduct the thigh and uh, medial thigh sensory loss will be there in obturator nerve. Similarly, femoral nerve, there will be a uh, pelvic fractures often injure the femoral nerve and what is the sensory motor deficit you should know. I leave it the literature for you to review. Sciatic nerve enters the gluteal area and uh, lot of times injection wrongly given, IM injection into the gluteus can injure it. And common peroneal nerve winds around the neck of fibula and any fracture there can injure it. And uh, uh, typically there will be a slapping gait whenever the common peroneal is injured and uh, they will have a problem and uh, while they are walking they will have a stepping gait. And if you look at the sensory loss, it is the dorsum of the foot where there is a sensory loss uh, is what you have to basically um, remember. Similarly, so like tibial nerve, when our posture dislocation of the knee joint is there, tibial nerve is injured and uh, there is a sensory loss in the sole of the foot. That is what you need to basically remember. And these people typically will have the inability to plantiflex the foot. So that is the reason they remain in dorsiflexion. They will have a impaired ability to invert whenever tibial nerve is injured. That is the reason foot remains everted. So in the clinical case given to you, it is a tibial nerve injury is what you need to remember. Even though you guessed it as tibial nerve, that is not enough. You should know that tibial nerve serves the plantar surface of the foot, the sensory supply is what you have to ultimately remember. Now let us take up the next question. A 23 year old presents and the imaging typically shows the dislocation of the clavicle at the acromioclavicular junction. So what is normally preventing factor, preventing the dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint is a very important question. It is the acromioclavicular ligament which is the one which is preventing is what you have to basically understand. A 43 year old complaints of abdominal pain, CD scan of the abdomen is being shown and what you are able to see retroperitoneal hematoma. So which organ, which viscera injury in trauma lead to development of a retroperitoneal hematoma? So out of all the structures, pancreas is a retroperitoneal structure as all of you know. And it is the pancreatic injury which lead to the development of uh, such a large retroperitoneal hematoma. So where is the vomiting center located in this MRI is a very important question. So you must know how to identify thalamus, pitamen, caudate, medulla, pons, midbrain, etc. on the MRI which we have discussed very detailed way in our regular DNB, AIMS, PGI, question bank discussions. So it is uh, uh, one which is labeled D, this structure, this is the medulla. 
So this is the one which is typically associated with the vomiting center is what you need to remember. A 54 year old is found to have a mass lesion which is shown on the laparoscopy. What do you see here? There is a twisted ovarian tumor. So ovary blood supply comes from the ovarian ligament. So that is the one which need to be basically ligated. A 52 year old has received a IM injection and developed a Trendlenburg sign positivity. That means his gluteal muscle is out. And what is it supplied by? It is typically supplied by sciatic nerve. So I mean the gluteal nerves and uh, typically uh, the safe zone to give a IM injection will be on the superior lateral aspect. But if by mistake superior medial aspect if the injection is punched, then uh, uh, that lead to development of uh, Trendlenburg positivity is what need to be remembered. 11 year old is having a complaint of pain and numbness in the dorsum of the foot and cannot dorsiflex the ankle. Then what is the site of compression? As we have already discussed common peroneal nerve injury occur near the fibular head. So that is the one which is typically injured. Now a 58 year old presents with a painless mass in the groin. So what do you see in the groin? This is the area where you are having the uh, uh, inguinal, superficial inguinal lymphadenopathy. Can you appreciate that? So anal canal, what is the lymphatic drainage of anal canal? If you look at the area of the anal canal distal to the dentate line, it is a superficial inguinal lymph nodes. And around the dentate line, Typically, it will go to obturator and hypogastric lymph nodes. And uh, ultimately, from there, they will drain into presacral, external iliac, and deep inguinal lymph nodes. A 34 year old with a decreased hearing in both ears is a rock musician and has been spending a lot of time in studio, and you have been shown audiogram. So basically, you should know how to recognize different shapes of the audiogram. In CSOM, how will be the audiogram? In noise induced hearing loss, how will be audiogram? In otosclerosis, how will be audiogram? One of the audiogram based MCQs will definitely be asked in uh, either the NEET PG or in the DMB actual exam for which you are uh, very much aspiring. So, doctor, it is the noise hearing, noise induced hearing loss. So, organ of corti is the one which is typically injured. Now, uh, there is a Dobby's criteria as to how will you identify a noise induced uh, hearing loss, but that much uh, deep knowledge is not required unless you plan to join MS ENT. Um, so, for entrance it is always hot topics, popcorn like topics, pick up, eat, forget kind of uh, things uh, which you have to be very sure. Uh, you must know what are the examiner's expectations. Forget about your expectations of being a good student. We can never be a good student. Uh, Treating patients, learning experience itself is the best teacher. Every time you are dealing a case, you are unable to understand what's going wrong and then you, from the patient you went to books, that's much better. All that we read today is not for becoming really experts in medical practice, but only to pass exam. So let us be smart enough to read, master, cover all subjects and get a decent score in the exam. 53 year old with dull ache in the shoulder interfering with the sleep. Local tenderness is present about the acromion and uh, uh, there is a severe pain. So a tendon of which muscle is most likely inflamed whenever the pain is there when the person is raising the hand overhead is a very important question.
it is supraspinatus tendon whenever it is being injured continuously when you are sitting before computer laptop nowadays life has become very immobile then people will end up in shoulder pains pains here and there nothing to worry just go and start doing physiotherapy you have to advise the patient and that will enable um to stretch your ligaments and tendons which will make you much more improved fitness a 65 year old complaining of hearing loss and audiogram is taken but for i am not going to leave you you should know how to recognize a high frequency hearing loss medium frequency low frequency noise induced hearing loss etc so where is the injury so it is basically um a audiogram is showing uh, a low frequency hearing loss very simple so this is a low frequency hearing loss the best example is meniere's disease you get this kind of audiogram then uh, uh middle uh, frequency hearing loss typically looks like this then high frequency hearing loss typically looks like this and a flat hearing loss looks like this a 58 year old has uh, repeated coffee ground vomiting you have done a initial stabilization endoscopy is being done and there is a deep bleeding ulcer which is being found along the duodenal bulb's posterior wall so you must know what is the blood supply of stomach and duodenum thoroughly so it is a gastroduodenal artery which supplies the posterior wall of the duodenal bulb is what you need to basically remember a 30 year 38 year old male presents with difficulty in walking and on gait examination you found the krendlenburg positivity it is a superior gluteal whose injury will lead to the development of this kind of clinical presentation 56 year old presents with shoulder pain that has started to interfere with the daily activity now you are able to see the radiograph and uh, what is the most likely to provoke pain in this patient uh there is a calcification in the supraspinatus tendon in case of uh, the uh, radiograph which you are seeing so supraspinatus tendon calcification lead to a pain whenever you are doing the abduction of the humerus or raise your hand above the head that is the typical activity 55 year old past medical history is non contributory blood pressure is low ct scan is being done and there is a ulcer which is bleeding is being found along the lesser curvature of the stomach so the lesser curvature stomach typically is supplied by the left gastric artery is what examiner is expecting to answer from you 34 year old has a severe right shoulder pain after falling from a tree and x ray has been shown to you what do you see you see the fracture of the clavicle and the medial segment is being displaced upward which muscle pull will be responsible for such a displacement typically it is the sternocleidomastoid muscle whose pull is responsible for a upward displacement of the medial segment of a clavicular fracture is what you need to basically know a 48 year old complaining of intermittent pain and there is a bulge below the inguinal ligament but lateral to the pubic tubercle and uh, the bulge laterally contracts which structure is the very important question so it is a femoral hernia that examiner is describing so femoral vein is the structure which can get compressed a 48 year old is shown a kub where is the stone located typically the stone is located in the upper ureteric area upper ureteric stone so upper part of the ureter what is the blood supply is the examiner's question and that is the renal artery which supplies a 48 year old gardener presents with pain and uh, there is a bursa which is being inflamed so what is that bursa most likely to be it is a prepetalar bursitis that you are typically seeing 
which is quite common among the godless. A 67 year old complains of a difficulty in micturition and uh, after taking few weeks of doxajosin, the patient is having an improvement. So how does the doxajosin, I mean, what is possibly the problem in the patient? Typically bladder outlet obstruction which occur because of the enlargement of the prostate. That is taken care by giving uh, doxajosin uh, which acts on the alpha receptors. So it is the prostate which is shown labeled D in case of that diagram. Why aspiration pneumonia commonly occurs in the right lower lung lobe is a very important question. The right lower lobe it uh, receives, uh, uh, sorry, the answer should be um, the right main bronchus is straighter than the left main bronchus. That is the main reason. Uh, answer should be changed to B. A 63 year old is having muscle pain and fatigue. His urine sample is being shown, a dark colored urine. And his past medical history is significant for stable angina. And he is on metoprolol, etervastatin, and aspirin. His creatinine is elevated. So, what is the most likely culprit possibly could be responsible? It is a myoglobinuria. In a patient already taking the drugs which can predispose to the myositis. So, erythromycin is known, especially male patients 60 years and old are at risk of developing myoglobinuria on erythromycin. A 62 year old is having a dry cough and taking a lot of medications. So a lot of times whenever dry cough is there and uh, lungs are clear, x-ray chest is clear, everything is clear, you should always review for the presence of whether any ACE inhibitors are there like Ramapril, Captopril, etc. in the drugs. 70 year old with a muscle pain and fatigue and past history of hypertension and creatinine kinase is elevated then uh, what is the drug combination most likely that can lead to development of a muscle injury. Jump fibrogel and eternovastat in combination can sometimes be responsible. Which drug if you use in monotherapy can increase instead of decreasing increase the triglyceride levels. Cholesteramine among the hypolipidemic drugs has a tendency to lead to development of increased triglycerides paradoxically. So you should get that explanation from our biochemistry and pharmacology class. A 43 year old initiated to treat her hypertension and typically she developed a pedal edema. Calcium channel blockers are very much known to lead to development of pedal edema like amlodipine. A 34 year old with episodes of abdominal pain and vomiting has a very high triglyceride level of 1800. So hyperlipidemia can be hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia or it can be combined. So you must be very sure which one it is. Triglycerides are treated by a good exercise and uh, jamfibrogil and niacin are the ones. Now a deaf couple have a hereditary form of deafness. They are recently married and want to advise on their chances of their children getting affected. And their pedigree has been shown. Looking at this pedigree, you must know what is the inheritance pattern. There are only five inheritance patterns. X-linked receive dominant, autosomal receive dominant and mitochondrial inheritance. So you must be able to guess what it is. Both males and female offspring are affected. Of an affected female have that trait. Let's look into uh, this. Females offsprings can get affected. Even affect um, females, a females female offspring or even a male offspring of an affected female are affected. There is one important clue. Then uh, all female offsprings of a ma affected male, affected males, all female offsprings, you take uh, affected male, all female offsprings, but not the male offsprings are affected. 
because its x linked dominant and male contributes to one single x for the production of the daughter even that one single x from coming from the dad is abnormal it being x linked dominant it will show the presence so that is a very important uh, finding so these clues point it towards x linked dominant kind of inheritance pedigree then what is the kind of inheritance pedigree you can see here whenever male is affected he is not transmitting but whenever female is affected she is uniformly transmitting so what is the likely possibility what is there only with the female and not with the male the egg is sponsored by mom so mitochondrial inheritance typically male can never transmit but affected female uniformly transmits to everybody you can see granny ma had it and all the three children of the granny of the granny ma had it but mama is having it but mama's children are not at all affected but uh, um maternal aunts aunt is there one is not married other is married and her all children are affected so that is the fundamental difference that is how you recognize mitochondrial inheritance definitely these questions will come doctor in neat pg and uh, um aims dnb pgi chandigarh jipmer hardly four or five exams to contest in the modern time and fmg now a deaf couple both have hereditary form of inheritance and uh, they have recently married assuming that both family have the same mutation causing deafness what is the likelihood of the children getting affected so both the families have same mutations and marrying so uh but neither parent is affected so there is a mutation but neither of them are affected there is a in the family there is a mutation but neither of the uh, parents are affected means both of them are carrying not a autosomal dominant but a autosomal recessive when two autosomal recessives happen to marry 100% chance is there for their children to get affected is what you need to basically remember a 5 year old male was admitted with two day history of blood stain diarrhea there is a periorbital edema investigation show the pt apt all being normal and his blood picture is being shown so we find the presence of fragmented rbc which are called as cystocytes cystocytes are there means there are two possibilities it can be hemolytic uremic syndrome or ttp or it can be dic dissonant intravascular coagulation how to differentiate hemolytic uremic syndrome ptabtt are normal but dic ptabtt are prolonged that's how you differentiate but you should recognize that there is a cystocyte once you recognize look at ptabtt if it is normal it is hus if it is not normal and prolonged it is dic that's how you uh, go about a 5 year old with two day history of blood stain diarrhea uh periorbital edema then uh, the same case which investigation do you like to request commonly hemolytic uremic syndrome is being uh, precipitated by hemorrhagic e coli o157 h7 strain so that need to be investigated now 67 year old collapsed from the bottom of the stairs in his home jvp is not raised and um, she is drowsy and his left lower limb is externally rotated and painful and uh, urine analysis shows blood is 3 positive and uh, uh, um, there is a fracture of the femur which is being seen and there are hyperkalemic tall t waves in the ecg so myoglobin urea which is commonly found whenever there is any fracture trauma crush injury of the limb that typically lead to this combination of hyperkalemia tall peak t waves raised urea creatinine and cpk levels etc etc 
then uh, a 16 year old there is a four day history of dry cough, right sided pleuritic chest pain and breathlessness and he has a temperature of 100.4 and there is a rash and uh, uh, what do you see here target lesions which are typically seen in erythema multiforme. Then his radiography is showing the lower lobe opacities and his blood picture is showing RBC agglutination. So when there is erythema multiforme, pneumonia with uh, RBC agglutination all will make you remember what? Mycoplasma pneumonia. So he is also having typically a low sodium value. So pneumonia can be one of the predisposing factor for the development of syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion is what you need to remember. So he does not have warm antibodies but he has got a cold agglutinins due to mycoplasma pneumonia. Now a 14 year old female with intermittent colicky abdominal pain with vomiting and several episodes admitted and uh, bubble sounds were tickling and uh, hernial orifices are normal and uh, her investigations have been given where thyroid, bone biochemistry, blood glucose, everything is normal. So serum immunoglobulins are normal and uh, one of her sibling is showing the presence of uh, hereditary angioedema signs. Typically in hereditary angioedema, there is a edematous distension of the bubble which is responsible for the abdominal pain. But abdominal pain can be due to lead poisoning, due to porphyria, everything is being out uh, ruled out. So how do you manage um, hereditary angioedema which is due to sebum estrase deficiency? You can use fresh frozen plasma which is effective, tranexamic acid also effective. But uh, the regular uh, anaphylactic edema, the hydrocortisone chlorofenramine which you use are not effective in case of hereditary angioedema. Now a 34 year old from Kolkata with a 4 day history of passing dark urine and uh, he complains of melaise, lethargy and weakness and uh, there is a sharp lower chest pain which is burst on inspiration and uh, uh, the urobilinogen is 3 plus, hemosiderine is 2 plus and bilirubin is 33 and uh, etc etc had been given and uh, alkaline phosphatase is 94 and uh, the radiograph has been shown. Uh, so what is the most likely possibility? Typically the radiograph is showing atelectasis, there is a raised dome of diaphragm, atelectasis of the lower, uh, left lower lobe. And uh, uh, typically he is a case of hemolysis, hemolytic anemia which is happening. And uh, the dark color is because of the hemoglobinuria, which typically occur in intravascular hemolysis, is what you have to basically remember. A 18 year old has a sharp left sided chest pain on running up a flight of stairs, and uh, chest x ray is being shown to you. And uh, uh, there is a clicking sound synchronous with the heart sounds. Uh, so what is the likely possibility? Typically, if you look at the left sided apical area, there is a pneumothorax. Whenever pneumothorax, left sided apical area is there, then you get a click sounds on auscultation, which will be synchronous with the heartbeat. That is a classical history of a left sided apical pneumothorax. A 33 year old comes from Sahyadri forest in Maharashtra with high fever, headache and rigors and you have done the complete blood picture. 
What do you see? Banana shaped organisms, which are the gametocytes of falciparum malaria, is what you have to basically recognize. A 15 year old has got a short stature. She measured 4 feet and her sister measured 5 feet and her history is being given to you. So, in this entire story, what is important to remember is her calcium levels are low, phosphate levels are raised, but the alkaline phosphatase is normal. So, there are two possibilities where this can occur. One is whenever there is an idiopathic hypoparathyroidism or a pseudo hypoparathyroidism that is a context where you have this combination of low serum calcium with a raised phosphate and a normal alkaline phosphatase is what you need to basically appreciate. A 55 year old from Pune presented with severe anterior chest pain, he is hypotensive, ECG is being performed and uh, uh, ECG is being performed. Uh, what do you see in this uh, given context? Typically, there is an inferior wall MI. If you look at 2, 3 AVF, you can see the ST segment elevation. Along with that, there is a complete heart block with the AV dissociation. And on 2D echo, you can see the presence of a intimal flap and aneurysm aortic dissecting aneurysm. So, how do you want to treat it? Immediately call a cardiothoracic surgeon and he need to operate. So, what is the cause in aortic aneurysm for the development of inferior wall MI? You know that coronaries take origin from the root of iota. Whenever aortic aneurysm is there which is dissecting, that will decrease the blood flow to the coronaries and that lead to development of an acute MI. So, that is a problem. So, it is not due to coronary atherosclerosis. There is no point in doing PTCA or giving streptokinase. You want to repair that aortic dissecting aneurysm which is considered to be the definitive treatment is what you have to basically understand. A 70 year old presents with the lesions in the lower limbs which have been shown in the figure. And uh, there is a tender swelling on the anterior aspect of the left thigh. And he, he is living alone. 30 years. So, such a people who live alone, if the wife is there by force or by putting a total parental nutrition, she will feed the hub. But the wife being not there, he being nomadic alone, then whatever available he will eat. And ultimately, such people suffer from nutritional deficiencies. So, what you are seeing here is all the petitiae because of the vitamin C deficiency that you get from the history. A 48 year old, 11 month history of abdominal cramps and diarrhea. Then she had total abdominal hysterectomy, salpingo oophorectomy, followed by a course of external radiotherapy. Now she is presenting with the laboratory findings given to you and in the mouth there is mucositis. What is it commonly due to? Typically, um, it can be a radiation enteritis is a possible diagnosis and that is the reason she has to take a small bubble meal to discover the presence of radiation enteritis. 18 year old female has blood tests that are being shown to you. MCV is 60 which is microcytic anemia and blood film is being shown to you where you are finding target cells. Target cells are a feature of thalassemia or it can be in iron deficiency. So, what is the likely possibility? Beta thalassemia minor is the possibility in this given case. Now, 76 year old with gradual onset of breathlessness, there is a strider and uh, there is a mass palpable in front of it and trachea is being deviated. And you can see the airflow obstruction and presence of antimediastinal mass lesion and previously she has a history of thyroid dysfunction in the history. So, what is the likely possibility in his given case? So, what are the four T's you will remember when we talk about uh, anterior mediastinal mass lesion doctor? Four T's you should remember. 
T for thymoma, T for terrible lymphoma, T for teratoma, and T for retrosternal thyroid is are the four T's which are the anterior mediastinal mass lesions is what you have to ultimately remember. Yes, Rubel is online. Why not Niacin for our earlier case he was asking. But Niacin, Pellagra, the typical paint like dermatitis, that is a different story. That's what. Now, uh, yeah. Now the blood results are being performed two months after apart in a patient with HIV, October versus December. By the time it is December, within two months, hemoglobin fell down, MCV became macrocytic and uh, reti count increased, which is suggestive of hemolysis. Uh, so, typically the patient might be taking um, zidovudin and zidovudin toxicity is associated with the findings that you are seeing in the month of December in terms of a macrocytic anemia and uh, the presence of uh, a bone marrow suppression that's what you are typically seeing. Now 30 year old from Kolkata admitted with two months history of increasing lethargy and ankle swelling and her temperature is 37.5, the JVP is grossly elevated, there is a moderate ascites and sputum is showing the presence of AFB, acid fast bacilli and 2D echo is showing the presence of pericardial fluid and effusion and the presence of electrical alternance, one tall voltage, one short voltage. They are all suggestive of pericardial effusion which can very much occur whenever there is any tuberculosis. So that is the reason it is a case of tuberculous pericardial effusion is what you have to basically remember. Now, um, a cardiac catheter is passed in a 13 year old 5 years apart. Tomorrow you are a cardiothoracic surgeon or a cardiologist within another 4-5 or five years you will become one of them. So when you become one of them you must know how to identify a left to right shunt or whether it is a right to left shunt based on the oxygen saturation levels in the various chambers of the heart whenever you are doing the cardiac catheterization. So that is what it is based on. It is originally a left to right shunt five years back and now it becomes a, it became a right to left shunt. Why is it so? A more detailed explanation I left it in the um, literature. So it is very simple, you pass a catheter, check the oxygen saturation four chambers. If the left to right shunt, what will happen? The good blood is going into the bad blood, no problem. But if right sided blood comes in merges into the left side, reversal of shunt, then the left sided chamber oxygen saturation levels will fall down. So typically the left ventricle if you look at the saturation levels, um, typically the percentage saturation, uh, 5 years ago it was 95 percent, now it fell down to 57 percent. So the fall of the saturation is a sign to say that earlier a left to right shunt which was there has now transformed into a right to left shunt leading to the fall of the saturation on the left sided chambers is what you will you basically understand. Now a 45 year old comes to his psychiatrist with 3 month history of lethargy. This week I have seen a movie, excellent movie, you should also take time to see it. It's called Awakenings. Awakenings is uh, enacted by Robert De Niro and uh, it's there on the Netflix. Wow, wonderful movie. 
you will see how Parkinsonism patients will suffer. What is dementia pugilistica? Why the Parkinsonism got that name? Everything, a very, very heart rendering uh, uh, movie, Awakenings, Robert De Niro on Parkinsonism. You should uh, definitely take a chance to watch it and tell me the feedback next week after your DNB exam is over. 45 year old, referred to local psychiatrist with 3 month history of lethargy, loss of appetite, nausea, early morning awakening. And he had experienced intermittent abdominal pain after meals, which was investigated with upper GI endoscopy. And uh, his investigations have been given to you. Now, the eye is showing band keratopathy, which typically occurs due to calcifications. And his hand is showing the signs of hyperparathyroidism. So it is a case of hyperparathyroidism based on these two investigations and the past history and lab investigations. You must be in a position to enunciate a diagnosis. Now, uh, this brings us to the end of uh, the image based questions. So doctor, next week you have a bar to win the DNBCET exam. And I wish good luck to all of you. And once your exam is over, um, those who are in the beginning stage of preparation, we are always with you. That every week from 18th of June, every Sunday we will have a test and a discussion. And lot of our teachers who took a summer break in the month of May, uh, they are all back. And we are going to have regular classes and sessions and uh, to support you until you get a very good dream rank in the forthcoming NEED PG 2017. So that is our good wish to all of you. Thank you.